Our fears are so out of proportion to the reality. It's not that they're not things to worry about. You know, we are all worried about some aspect of getting older, getting sick, ending up alone, running out of money. And those fears are legitimate and real. But what never dawns on most people is that the experience of reaching old age or middle age or even just aging past youth, this stuff kicks in early, can be better or worse depending on the culture in which it takes place, right? And in a really youth-centric society, it makes it a lot harder. And we're told from early on, oh, it's all going to be you know, awful when you get older. And then it's easy for those things to become self-fulfilling prophecies as we reach, especially as we reach the age at which they're supposed to kick in and render us um, drooling, incompetent um, messes. Welcome to Uprising. Each episode looks inside what it takes to lead the most dynamic and successful cultural movements. Some of them in the business world, some in the social realm, some in politics, and some in between, to see why people start uprisings. What gives those initiatives momentum and keeps them going? And most important, what lessons can you learn from these movements and how to apply them to your business and even personal life. Let's explore the secret to sparking movements that move people into action. Passionate ideas. Controversial ideas. Uprising ideas. The power is now in the hands of anyone. To start a cultural movement. Hi, this is Scott Goodson and welcome back to Uprising, the podcast about movements, movement marketing, Um, and uprisings. We are living in the age of movements. Movements are happening all around us. They're happening in the business world, in politics, in the social space. Movements today can take an idea and accelerate it around the world very quickly. Movements at the end of the day are about standing up and saying there's something that we need you to hear. Something, more importantly, that you need to do. Something you need to do differently. Something you need to do now. Because movements emanate from ideas, but are grounded in action. Recently, up on the penthouse floor of Strawberry Frog on Madison Avenue in New York City, we had the inaugural Frog Talks, where we had movement makers, movement doers, talking about the movements that they're leading. And in the next few days, we're going to release the Frog Talks to the world on the Strawberry Frog website and on the Strawberry Frog Facebook page. So hopefully you'll have a chance to check in on that. There were some extraordinary speakers and it was an evening of delight, education, inspiration. We are living in the age of injustice. On the Uprising Pod, we've already explored the Black Lives Matter movement, which takes a stand against the discrimination of black people in America. Today, we're gonna focus on a different kind of discrimination that is often overlooked or forgotten, ageism or the discrimination based on someone's age. Yet this is happening at a time when people are living longer, when people have more to give in their lives, in their work, in their careers, where people take on second, third careers, where one of the most popular new magazines is Married Again, where people want to engage in their society well into their 60s and 70s and beyond. Here to explore this growing movement and to talk about her counter movement is the author of This Chair Rocks, a manifesto against ageism. Ashton, let's get started broad. What is ageism to you? Uh, the textbook definition of ageism is stereotyping and discrimination on the basis of age. Uh, I think of it less formally as uh, we're being ageist anytime we come to an opinion about a person or a group of people based on how old we think they are. It's letting age shape your preconceptions about someone. Where do you see it active in society today? Um, Well, let's start with between our ears. Um, Do you ever blame an ache uh, or pain on uh, being old without considering whether you perhaps, um, you know, ran 10 miles or cooked dinner for 10 people or whether, It's an old gag, but as I say, I stopped blaming my sore knee on being 65 uh, when it dawned on me that my other knee doesn't hurt and it's just as old. Um, Look at every, um, you know, every ad for wrinkle cream and uh, think about the fact that, you know, or or, 
um, or just, you know, magazines and billboards everywhere. The, the, there are seldom any older people in, a, in a visible at all unless they're selling cruises or medications. And I can assure you that people over 65 buy things besides medication. I mean, ageism is so pervasive that they don't even try to sell us things, which tells you something. Look at, look at children's books, The Ugly Hag or the placid granny, or the cranky Homer Simpson. They're older people, you know, this, these messages start young, they're pervasive, they're everywhere in the media and popular culture, and it's not okay. How did you get involved in this movement, and how did you decide this is something you <laughs> want to devote your life to? <laughs> What's left of it? Um, <laughs> I, just, I, just quit my, uh, I just quit my day job to do this full time. Thank you, Medicare. Um... You know, I backed into it as I back into most things in life. I It started as a project about older people who work, which in hindsight was a sort of nice, safe, entree, upbeat, positive, soundbite friendly passage into thinking about age and aging more broadly. And I met, you know, meeting people, they were a dime a dozen, and they were all interesting and varied and in the world in interesting ways, which did not surprise me. What did surprise me, because I was also learning about longevity, because that's what I do, I'm, you know, a journalist and a, and a researcher, was how many of my um, preconceived notions about aging, about getting older, were uh, way too negative, not nuanced at all, or just flat out wrong. For one example, I thought the odds of ending up in a nursing home were pretty, pretty good. And the percentage of Americans over 65 in nursing homes is 4%, and it's dropping. I've read 3% in Time Magazine. Um, I figured old people were depressed because they were old and they were going to die soon. And then I learned that the longer people live, the less they fear dying and that older people enjoy better mental health than the young or middle aged. It's the underpinnings of the U curve of happiness. Google U curve of happiness. It shows that everywhere in the world, people are happiest at the beginnings and the ends of their lives. So my head started to explode. Um, and I thought, why don't we know these things? And to, to oversimplify, we don't know them because we, are, we, we live in a culture that drowns them out. If aging is framed as a problem, we can be sold stuff to fix it, in quotes, or cure it, like wrinkle cream, um, you know, which doesn't work and costs a lot of money. And aging is not a problem, and it's not a disease. It is a natural powerful, lifelong process. It starts as soon as we're born. It's not just something inconvenient that parents or baby boomers do. And, you know, it's a source of enormous power and growth in addition to difficulties. I'm no Pollyanna. You know, there's lots about aging that's challenging, but there's also a lot of stuff that we gain. And I just want to make sure that we're hearing both sides of the story. Going back to the idea of preconceived notions, why do you think we view and fear our later life as grim? Because we, we fear it because of all those messages that come at us from childhood on that frame it as something yucky or scary. A little bit of it, I think, is just human in that older people are indeed reminders of mortality. But aging is living, right? Dying is just what happens at the end of all that living, you know, bits of uh, physical function, some aspect of your body is going to fall apart. But most of us find ways to compensate for that and to continue doing the things that matter the most to us, right? It's not as though you hit some divide between old and young, after which it's all downhill. You know, your 20s are hard. And ageism cuts both ways. Ageism is any negative judgment about millennials being spoiled. Or kids being, you know, kids are like that is a, is a totally ageist sentiment because how could everyone of the same age be the same of an entire generation? And one of the many paradoxes, or I should say ironies of ageism is that, you know, a group of seven-year-olds, they're all, of course, very distinct individuals, but they have an awful lot in common d developmentally, right? and experientially. They're a lot more alike than a group of 27-year-olds who are a lot more alike than a bunch of 47-year-olds and so on out. The longer we live, 
the more different we become from each other physically, neurologically, socially. So the less your age says about you and the more absurd it is to generalize about what old people are like. And stereotyping is, of course, the basis of all prejudice. What is the origin of these yucky pictures of older people in diapers and depictions of older people as cranky? When do we start seeing elderly people in this light? You know, it's, it's a big question. In a, in a capitalist society, there is less tolerance for people who do not um, pay their way in conventional economic terms, as in make a lot of money. Young people don't make a lot of money and retired people don't make a lot of money. And of course, older people contribute an enormous amount in ways, many continue to work in conventional ways. The whole idea of retirement is being radically revised day by day. But even if a, a someone stays home and watches a kid so the parents can go out and um, you know get a paycheck, that's contributing, right? So, so this very harsh binary, uh, doesn't in in a, in a capitalist um, society doesn't isn't good for older people. Neither is urbanization. You know, in smaller communities where people live in community and have contact with people of all ages, and of course the same is true if people of all races. Or you know, whenever you bring people together who are different, it's much harder for prejudice to persist. Um, you know, then then people continue to have a function, a visible, valuable function in society. Uh, right, you know, almost right to the end. There is, of course, a paradox. The people that are typically ageist against millennials are older people who see millennials ruining businesses, ruining the economy. Absolutely. And on the other end, we see millennials being ageist against the elderly. Can you expand <laughs> on this paradox? I, I can definitely talk about that. But first of all, can I beg you never to use the word elderly again? I don't like elderly for two reasons. Well, three. Well, flesh crawling. Um, it's... Um, it's not something you ever hear an older person call themselves. And a really good rule of thumb is don't call people something they wouldn't call themselves. And also it's usually preceded by the elderly and which implies that all older people are a distinct block and nothing could be further from the truth. Um, I don't, I, the word I, when I was writing my book, um, I got tired of typing older people, which I think is the only acceptable thing to call older people. So I've solved, this is one problem that I have solved. I refer to older people as olders and younger people as youngers because it's value neutral. Um, I, I, a lot of people use elders. It's not part of my culture and I don't like it because it's value laden. I don't think that older people are better than or superior to or wiser than younger people. I think each human being in an ideal rainbow unicorn filled universe deserves respect and deserves to be looked at as an individual, independent of whether they're in a wheelchair, what color their skin is, how old they are, and so on. And the other thing I like about olders and youngers is that it emphasizes the really obvious fact that age is a spectrum, right? There's not this point where you wake up old. Everyone, because we live in an ageist world, is terrified of being old, except the few radical spirits who are like, God damn it, I'm old. And I'm good with it, and I'm going to claim old. And that's a fantastic thing. But to say we're not there yet for most of us would be an understatement. Most people are reluctant to, most older people are reluctant to identify as old. And that's why I like older, younger, because it, it gets around this, this false idea that there's some divide and you're going to wake up some morning and it's all going to suck because you woke up on the wrong side of it. I'm constantly reminding people that, you know, already you probably can't run as fast as you used to, for example, or whatever, see as far, you know, some physical measure. We have a thousand ways of compensating and substituting such that we can continue to do the things. All these measures are relative. There is no point at which it's all awful unless you, you know, something disastrous could happen to you, of course, but it could happen when you're 28 or 88. It's not age specific. I want to talk about the negative impacts of ageism now. The Washington Post wrote an article titled, Baby Boomers Are Taking on Ageism. 
Mm-hmm. The article talks about the negative effects these myths and this discrimination has on the community, especially in the workplace. They face long-term unemployment and are often the first to get hacked due to their higher health care costs and legacy pensions. How else are baby boomers and the elderly being affected by the ageism movement? Well, ageism uh, affects every part of our lives. The workplace is often the first place that um, men in particular become aware of it, and it is the first form of discrimination that many white men encounter. Welcome to our world. So I'm looking forward to um, some of those people getting woke and joining the movement. Uh, It is the personal and economic consequences of age discrimination in the workforce are devastating. I mean, people cannot get, they send out hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of resumes and don't even get a call back or are told that they are too qualified. Um, this is, and then there's all these persistent myths about older people taking jobs away from younger people. That has been debunked countless times. It's called the fallacy of the lump of labor. The amount of labor is not fixed. The older and younger people also rarely compete for the same job. If the only job in town is a barista at Starbucks, you're going to get olders and youngers competing for it. But that is not a too many old people problem. That is a labor market problem. So it depends on how it's framed. Uh, you know, there's, again, so many ironies here. How are older people supposed to take care of ourselves if we are forced out of the workforce? The bigger problem, though, and you see it framed, I just was reading this horrible piece on Skype, uh, I mean on Slate, about um, how a- um, immigration is the cure for an aging workforce, but Republicans hate immigrants so much that they won't even consider that. Leaving Republicans out of it. The, it frames it as an old and sick, aging and sick workforce, and the the drain that we, I will identify with that older uh, workforce, put on younger, able-bodied workers. It is, that is a way that pits the generations against each other. The fact is that olders and youngers in the workforce alike are threatened by the same forces, the state of the economy, the state of the labor market. Hello, automation. We, Olders and youngers and everyone in between need to collaborate on revising the way we think of work entirely in such a way that it becomes a more equitable landscape for workers of all ages instead of getting distracted by sniping at each other. And there's also a larger ethical issue here. We know It's not that it doesn't still happen, but we know that it is not okay to allocate resources by race or by sex, right? And yet, listen for it around healthcare. Why should we spend money on old people who are gonna die soon? They don't say that part out loud, but it's hanging in the air, when we could spend it on young people. Or you see it in education, really easy to get funding for, um, you know, relatively easy, you know, for, for younger people, elementary school, high school. Educating older people, really hard to get funded. It is no more okay to allocate resources by age than it is by race or by sex. It is wrong and it is unethical. And when we see an argument framed that way, we need to simply reject the terms. For you, the listeners of Scott Goodson's Uprising Pod, Warby Parker is offering a free five-day home try-on to give you the opportunity to check out their glasses. To get your home try-on today, go to warbyparkertrial.com slash uprising. Again, that's warbyparkertrial.com slash uprising for your free five-day home try-on. You're listening to Scott Goodson and the Uprising Pod. Today, we're talking with Ashton Applewhite and the anti-ageism movement. Now, I want you to help me debunk some common myths people have about olders. Mm -hmm. As you get older, you get sicker and more fragile. True or not? Um, you know, there are, there are relatively few actual conditions, um, age related illnesses. One is Alzheimer's, another is Parkinson's and they are real and fearsome, but most, but, but aging itself is not a disease. Aging is the passage of time. As we go on, our body systems function less efficiently. Um, you know, lots, but a couple of things to remember, 
the preconditions for many of these things are set early on in life. Uh, an example being, you know, ob obesity and diabetes, um, smoking. Uh, old older age is when the the consequences crop up, but those are not diseases of old age, right? And another thing to keep in mind is that while there are conditions that are associated with age, like, you know, your, your vision doesn't, isn't as good. Most people's hearing deteriorates. Um, again, we have ways of, of compensating for them, as we all know. Remember that no one person comes down with all these symptoms, right? Also, that the you never hear in the media about the the vast um, numbers of really super healthy older people, right? They are numerous, but there's no policy debate around them, so they're largely invisible, except for the extreme cases of the people jumping out of airplanes or running marathons. And you know, more power to them, but they're outliers. And I think slightly a, uh, a digression here, which I'm happy to talk about the whole idea of successful aging. Um, most of us are going to land in the middle. Take, um, you know, take cognitive function. About 20% of the population escapes cognitive decline entirely. And I'm sure you can think right off the top of your head of a couple of those really, really sharp 90-year-olds that you know. Most of us are going to lose some processing speed specifically in that domain of memory where you uh, you know, can't remember the name of the movie that you saw with Robert De Niro and the secretary, whatever it was, uh, or you can't remember Robert De Niro's name. But that, you know, that doesn't keep us from functioning really effectively in the world and finding our car keys and getting out the door. And let's not forget that young people forget things too all the time, right? When we live in an ageist world, we tend to think, of every, you know, you forget something and you're like, oh crap, I'm coming down with Alzheimer's. No, you forgot where you put your keys because you were distracted. You know, if you don't remember what keys are for, that is a sign of, of possible serious cognitive problems. But when you can't remember the name of the movie, you know, it, it's irritating, but it doesn't, the point is these natural progressions don't keep the vast, vast, vast majority of us from being mobile, being happy, and finding our way in the world perfectly happily to the end. Older people can't live fun, adventurous lives. Dude, that's just ridiculous. I mean, I'm leading a fun, adventurous life. I'm 65. Um, I mean, what's, what's adventure? You know, if you are going to define adventure in the broadest um, physical terms, that adventure means jumping off a cliff strapped to a hang glider, then it's true. You're not going to see a whole lot of 80-year-olds um, probably doing that because, but if any in any other domain besides extreme physical um, activity, and I can hear if there were phone lines, they'd be ringing because there would be 80-year-old people on the phone running marathons saying, how dare you say? that older people are not, you know, phys can cannot achieve remarkable things in the physical domain as well. You know, look at all the older people who, who run corporations, who are amazing in the performing arts. As long as you are challenging yourself to do new things, that is an adventure, right? As long as we do something besides sitting on the TV and watching reruns, you know, we don't become completely different kinds of people as we age. If couch potatoes are typically couch potatoes in their 30s and they stay couch potatoes, people who like to travel or learn an instrument or go, um, you know, to, to something that challenges them or interests them or have a hobby or work in the community, we keep doing those things all our lives and we keep finding ways to do them. We don't become less adventurous. If you're adventurous at 20, you're gonna be adventurous as 80. And if that opportunity is denied to you, it's not because you got old, it's because you had the misfortune to age in a society that denied you access and opportunity. Olders are stuck in old ways and can't adapt to our modern technological world. Um, gee, it's really good. I had someone show me how to set up this Skype thing. How do you, could you spell Skype for me and teach me how, I mean, you know, <laughs> It's not a complete myth in that internet use does drop off with age, you know, but everyone now who's born digital is going to keep using the internet until they die. You know, people used to use horse-drawn, you know, plows, and then they got tractors, and now they have tractors that could probably get you to the moon and back. 
technology is always evolving. There's always a bar to learning it. Some people are better at it than others. But um, my, my tech support person is older than I am. He worked at uh, Apple for many years putting the, um, putting the Intel chip in. And he is more hip than I am. I have plenty of younger friends who, like, I can't get the hang of Snapchat. Um, you know, I, I sort of, I've been ageist myself, assuming that if someone is in their 20s or 30s, they must use all those new apps and know how to do everything. I was at a conference which was mostly older women. I was on a panel with a guy in his 30s, and he could not walk through the room without someone asking him to help them with their computers. It is ageist and sexist to assume that someone who is younger and someone who is male is a whiz on a computer. It is ageist and probably sexist to assume that an older person can't figure out how to do something herself on her computer. It has entirely to do with opportunity, which has, of course, something to do with class, and with um, ability and, and you know, the, the kind of person you are. And what you, I'm a little bit of a technophobe. I don't like to admit that. My partner says my IQ drops 30 points when I have to do anything on my computer, and that makes me angry at myself. However, I have figured out how to use Twitter and how to use Skype and how to use the internet because I invented an entirely new career for myself in my 50s um, because something really interested me. And I think that there were an awful lot of people out there. I know there are an awful lot of people out there. And again, there would be an awful lot more people like me out there if they didn't feel either because of their own internalized ageism or because of obstacles they have encountered in the world that they can't do it or shouldn't do it or couldn't find support doing it. Old isn't beautiful. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, so, it's really, really interesting. There is absolutely an equation in our consumer culture that just as um, fat isn't attractive, old isn't attractive, used to be that black isn't attractive. Remember the slogan, black is beautiful? from the 60s, um, you probably don't, but it was an early rallying cry of the first black power movements during the Civil War era. When a, a group of people is oppressed, faces oppression, one of the tools that is used is they are told that their physical being is repulsive. Think of Shylock in Merchant of Venice, Jews with their greasy hair and their hooked noses. Disgusting, right? That was a way, you do that, all, all prejudice relies on othering, seeing the, the oppressed group as other than ourselves. And one way we do that when the other is human is to say uh, that, that uh, the, the Negro was lesser, was more animal-like. That's what's around all the myths about black men being sexual predators. The women's movement came up with black as beautiful as a way to repudiate this idea that nappy hair and dark skin and flat noses were ugly because it's a, it's socially constructed. That means we make it up. And there was this whole fabulous renaissance of people realizing, you know, I the way I am is just gorgeous. And the minute you ha you feel that, you shake that off, you become confident. You see a lot of it around the body positivity movement, around weight for women, right? Have we learned nothing that, you know, that you are beautiful the way you are? And the discourse around age is exactly the same. Who says wrinkles are ugly? Wrinkles are a map of my life. And when I see a television anchor who, you know, all that's moving are her really puffy lips, which are filled with collagen, it creeps me out. And I feel badly for her that she hasn't been able to think that, you know, partly because if your face doesn't move, you feel fewer emotions. You know, if you don't smile, if your face doesn't smile, your brain doesn't get the message that you're happy. The bigger issue, I don't want to blame it on her. I want to blame it on a culture that says two ages to become ugly, two ages to fail, to be fat is to be undesirable. And I urge everyone to look between, of course, our ears. It starts between our ears. What do we think of ourselves when we look in the mirror and where do those messages come from? They come from the billion, billion dollar cosmetics beauty industry that is trying to sell you the message that you are too fat, too, too wrinkly, too wide, too whatever to be attractive. And one more point, look 
at the friends of yours, if the, if we can argue for the sake of argument that the goal is to be perceived as, you know, sexually desirable, look at your friends who are sexually active. They are not the thinnest. They are not the prettiest. They are not the youngest. They are the people who know that they are worth going to bed with. So I reject the idea that old equals ugly. I don't want to feed the trillion dollar cosmetics industry a whole lot of money. I mean, you know, all of this stuff has a huge class bias. None of these remedies are available to people without some disposable income, which is another reason all these forms of discrimination intersect and compound each other, right? The only anti-aging, and I use that word in quotes, um, thing that works is sunscreen. It's interesting you brought up the cosmetics industry. People spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to look younger. Why do you think people are obsessed with staying young? Because they don't want to be discriminated against. And they are really effective strategies. I mean, I completely understand why so many people, women in particular, um, lie about their ages, dye their hair to cover the gray, um, you know, try to pass for younger. Um, no judgment, I swear, but two points about that. It is like a person of color trying to pass for white or a gay person trying to pass for straight. It's not good for us, right? Because it's motivated by shame at something that should not be shameful. Why should getting older be a source of shame, right? The bigger issue abstractly is that when we do these things, and again, I get it. I totally understand why we do these things, but it, it glosses over, it gives a pass to the discrimination that makes those behaviors necessary, right? And as long as we do that, we don't address, you know, we think that if we're wrinkly or if we didn't get that job interview, it's our fault. And if only I use Snapchat or, you know, weighed 10 pounds less, or didn't have white hair, everything would be fine. Well, it wouldn't be fine. In, in the women's movement, a tool of the women's movement was consciousness raising. And what happened is that people came together and realized that what they were thinking of as personal problems, you know, their, their boobs weren't big enough, their kitchens weren't big enough, their husbands didn't make enough money, their boss didn't respect them. Uh, these were not personal problems. These were widely shared political problems that require collective action. And that's where we're beginning to get with ageism. So I would urge your listeners, you know, if you look at the mirror and think, I look awful, you know, think about where those messages come from. They come from people who want you to feel dissatisfied because then they can sell you crap, right? And think about what, what the body positivity movement has to tell us about accepting ourselves and putting our energy into making a more just society where what you look like is not the gateway to opportunity. Shifting gears back to something you mentioned earlier, healthcare. Healthcare is in the media right now with the new administration. It seems this new proposal would affect olders most. Is that ageism? That's absolutely not ageism. I mean, age is real. You know, they're, they're old and young are different, and, and age is absolutely a component of who we are. Um, so it's not as though, you know, a, a, the Medicare, there are more older people on Medicare than there are younger people. Uh, you know, and one point on that is, you know, that's, that's not greedy old people. That's what the system was designed for, right, to help people who could no longer be fully, um, you know, be fully responsible for themselves. Um, again, I would urge the, it, urge people to avoid it being framed as old versus young, because if your grandmother does not have Medicare that helps pay for her to live somewhere, you know, in a nice residence, hopefully a nice residence or some subsidy for home health care, that Medicare for, pays for a ton of that. Guess who has to do it? You. It is women who do most caregiving because it's not paid and it's not respected. And women's career trajectories suffer tremendously because they need flex time jobs so that they can drive their in-laws to the doctor or pick up the kids. Again, ageism, it is people at the younger and older ends of the spectrum who are not supported by society so that the burden falls on individual people in the middle of the age spectrum to hold the bag. 
right? So it's not about old versus young. It's about do we have a social safety net that covers people at both ends? And all the people in the middle who, you know, drop a brick on their foot and need a, you know, back back to all age friendly. You know, ramps are great for people in wheelchairs, but they're also great for people on, on crutches and for delivery people, right? You know, these things, same with uh, handicap accessible workforce and flex times. Flex time, those are things that many older people need, as do people with disabilities who come in all ages, but they also benefit People, um, you know, families who are who are juggling childcare and students, and you know, people all across the age spectrum. It's about a better workplace for everybody. We talked about causes and effects of ageism, but what can we actually do to stop the spread of ageism? <laughs> what we can do to stop the spread of ageism is first of all raise awareness of ageism, uh, and it starts um, it starts between your ears. So look at your own attitudes towards age and aging, and see how you use the words because uh, because we we are all biased, and ageism hasn't really had a light shown on it yet. So it's pretty interesting to see uh, see where it is and then you start to see it everywhere and it's like a genie getting out of a bottle you can't get it back in and it's very liberating um, start a consciousness raising group around age bias my website is thischairrocks.com and if you go to resources the first thing that pops up is a brochure called who me ageist how to start a consciousness racing group. Start a chapter of the radical age movement. That's the next thing that's um, up on my website. How to start a group around age bias. Um, read my book. It's called This Chair Rocks, a manifesto against ageism. It's got well over 100 five-star reviews. It's fun to read and it will educate you about the topic inside and out. If you don't have the time to read the book, listen to my TED Talk, 11 minutes. Um, on what ageism is, how it messes up with us. Um, You know, become aware, watch your language, and then call it out, call out ageist behavior when we see it around us. If someone says something ages to you, say, why would you say that? Why would you, um, what was the example someone just came up with? Oh, she, a woman on a call-in radio show, she was in a mall, they wanted her to watch a movie trailer and give her feedback. She did, she's handing the form back in and she gives, and the guy asks how old she is and she says, she tells him and he tears the form back up and says, oh, we don't want information from people that, that old. I mean, say, why would you do that? Why would you assume that, right? Question the, re, the, the um, you know, question the person's behavior, not in an aggressive way, but in a really just flat out, what, what were you thinking? Kind of, why, why would you call me young lady, right? Why, why would you say that? Because I'm not young. I'm fine with the age I am, but you're only calling me young lady to call attention to the fact that I'm not young. What's that about? And let that uncomfortable silence sit there. I have one really good snappy answer which is to when someone says, oh, you look great for your age, say, you look great for your age too. And just let it sit and have them think about why what they intended as a compliment doesn't feel like a compliment. You mentioned a few moments ago a radical aging movement. What would such a movement look like? It would look as different as every one of us is different. You know, I think it would look like a lot more white hair on the street in men and women. What I would love to do with my magic rainbow unicorn magic wand is wave imagine, wave it around so that everyone who actually has gray hair would be gray for an hour. And you would see that the gray hair people are not this t- teeny weeny fringe. They are, I mean, I don't, I don't know whether it'd be half or three quarters of the population, but most people who dye their hair to cover the gray start in their 30s, right? So... Think about the kind of society we want to have and start changing your own attitudes about your own age and aging and carry it out in the world. There is a group here called the Radical Age Movement and they have, um, you know, and they have a, a document, which is again on my website, for how to set up a chapter of your own. The Grey Panthers was an anti-ageism organization started in the 60s along with the anti-war movement, anti-Vietnam War. There's an active New York chapter, set up a chapter of your own. But start, you know, start with educating yourself and doing some consciousness raising in your community. So what would this world look like? It would be a world in which access to opportunity 
does not depend on what you look like. Um, sort of a reverse way to think about that is I often ask people what they think of as criteria for diversity. And everyone says race and sex and gender and maybe, you know, disability. When I say, what about age? No one says that's a dumb idea, right? Everyone says, duh, why not age? So look around. And if you're in a group where everyone is the same age, unless there's a really good reason for it, speak up about it. And if you don't want to take on a whole nother ism, think about this. Whatever you are interested in, whether it's, you know, getting people to the ballot, whether it's saving the whales, whether it's your local, you know, community garden, whatever, look around the metaphorical table. If everyone is the same age, your efforts are not going to be as effective as they could be. And when we come together at all ages to address whatever it is, we dissolve ageism in the process. Can you just expand on what an age-friendly world would look like? It would have parks. It would have benches. It would not have um, older people would not be segregated into retirement homes, and older people wouldn't want to be segregated into retirement homes. It would look, in that sense, um, like village life in that people of all ages, all sizes, all colors, all orientations would feel free to come and go from every aspect of life, not hindered by how, um, you know, what race they were, how old they were, um, what color skin they were, or who they, who they slept with. This is fascinating. So much great information. Where can listeners go to get more information, buy your book, or watch your TED Talk? Uh, you can, well, I am the only Ashton Applewhite in the world, so if you forget anything but my name, there's that. Um, my website is thischairrocks.com. Um, you can get the book there. You can get it on Amazon. It's a, where it's available in every electronic format and as an audio book. Um, I have a very active uh, This Chair Rocks Facebook page. I am at This Chair Rocks on Twitter, and I'm pretty active there. Uh, and if you uh, at Google TED plus ageism, my talk will come up. I delivered it at Big TED in April and got a standing ovation and I will say it is kick ass. So that's a really good place to start. And if you like it, tell other people about it, please. Just to spread I don't make any money off it. Just to spread the word because people say all the time, you know, as my son's uh, ex girlfriend said uh, said it's full of what she called no shit, oh shit moments, right? Like like, oh, this is the case. Oh, wait, why didn't I think of that? You know, it's full of information that is hidden in plain sight that we need to start seeing so that we can think differently, act differently, and take that change out into the world. Ashton, this was enlightening. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for joining the Uprising Pod today. If you want to find out more about who was on or if you want to learn more about how to create your own movement, please go to scottgoodsonsuprising.com. You can also download this Uprising program from iTunes and where other leading podcasts are curated. The Uprising Pod is produced by Nicola Keneally with special help from Melanie Boardman, Karin Drakenberg, Philippa Freeman, Brianna Campbell, Farshad Faroudi, Mark Bruzzi, Mark Issam, James Politi, and Jonathan Weeks. My name is Scott Goodson, and you've been listening to the Uprising Pod, what we can learn about movements and uprisings that are shaping our world in business, in society, and in between. For more on cultural movements and movement marketing, be sure to pick up a copy of the best-selling book, Uprising, How to Build a Brand and Change the World by Sparking Cultural Movements, available on Amazon.com. The music for the Uprising pod was created by Charles Duchateau. If you have a moment, please do give us a favorable review on iTunes so that our movement moves up the ranks of the iTunes podcast list. And if you have ideas for future shows, please let us know by going to scottgoodsonsuprising.com. Thank you, and speak to you soon.